dirty. Well, that's it. <laughs> don't yeah, worry. Sorry about that. <laughs> I don't really know the bottle of water. Yeah, please avail yourself. Uh, well, thank you. Thank you for stepping in at the last minute. Uh, I was looking forward to talking with Carol and I, and I look to uh, do that in the near future. But uh, so I suppose the, the obvious question is, uh, you know, you, you were administrator of NASA during uh, some interesting times. Do you think you did a good job? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, we talked about this last night. I mean, my main, uh, sorry, I was acting administrator of NASA from the day Biden was inaugurated till the day um, Senator Nelson was sworn in as the administrator. And my, my first, second, and third priority was to have the Biden administration support the Artemis program, was to not get a reset in human space flight again with another change of administration. So from that perspective, uh, yeah, <laughs> mission accomplished. <laughs> nice. Our Artemis program is supported. It was, I'll never forget the day we were, we were um, so the way the story goes is um, there's a woman, Kristen Fisher. She was a reporter for Fox News. She's now a reporter for CNN. She's actually the daughter of two astronauts. And um, oh. it was the end of the daily press briefing by Jen Psaki. And she asked the last question, and her question was, does the Biden administration support NASA's Artemis program? And Jen Psaki said, I don't know, but I'll find out. And so that night, we were communicating with the White House about Artemis and had a mess what the answer to that question was. It was obvious to us what the answer to the question was. <laughs> um, and then the next day, um, before uh, uh, she took, Jen Psaki took questions, um, she said, hey, Kristen Fisher asked a question yesterday, um, and I want to I want to answer it. The Biden administration absolutely supports NASA's Artemis program to put the first person of color, the first woman and the first person of color on the moon. We're really excited about it, et cetera, et cetera. And so uh, I did the happy dance and uh, mission accomplished. Yeah. Can you show us the happy dance now? Or is that? No, no, you know. Okay. Uh, well, what an opportune question that was the, uh, the, the, that she oh, asked. Oh, yeah. I, I had nothing to do with. Uh, Kristen a asking that question. I don't think anybody at NASA, she just happened to ask it because she was, uh, you know, a, uh, the space reporter for Fox and obviously very interested in space given her parents' background. Wow, journalism in action. All right, so uh, that sounds like something you can say uh, you did right. Is there anything you'd want to go back and maybe do a little different? Well, COVID was an incredible challenge. Um, okay. You know, we had this continuity of operations plan that sort of had this plan for uh, influenza pandemic. It was worthless. It was it was literally worthless for. Can COVID. you tell us what, what what was the plan? Like, you know, because in in the case of oh, we all have to stay home. Well, it was more month. like a continuity of operations plan. So it was like the executives at Hassa headquarters were going to hightail it out of town because there was, it was everything was happening in D.C. and like go to Johnson relocate to Johnson Space Center. Or, NASA Langley Research Center and, and run the agency remotely or devolve uh, agency operations to the leadership at Johnson Space Center. And that's not what we were going to do. This is not a Washington, D.C. event, right? This is a global event that was going to affect everybody. Um, I give Administrator Bridenstine a lot of credit. He took it very seriously and basically said, we are shutting everything down until we can figure out how to keep our workforce um, healthy and safe while we keep our missions moving forward. Um, so uh, I think we did some things right there, but we also just struggled with remote working. Um, we um, just culturally mm -hmm. we struggled with remote working and how to work remotely. And the tools um, that we had, we were in the process of using those tools in the regular course of doing business, but had not used Zoom or Teams or any remote collaboration and, and teleconferencing tools. So that was that was that was really that was really challenging. Uh, and then um, you know we had a lot of missions in integration and test, and you're not going to do INT remotely. Uh, we haven't figured out. We guess we could do it remotely if we could have robots and teleoperated robots to do INT. So keeping those missions moving forward, including um, you know the first crew mission, the test flight, the demo T test flight um, with SpaceX, which um, you know we launched in late May of 2020 after being in COVID for less than three months. Yeah. Um, so keeping all that moving forward while keeping the uh, workforce um, safe and healthy was a huge challenge. We we gave anybody who was in a situation where they couldn't socially distance, we gave them Fitbits. Um, so every night they wore it and they could monitor their blood oxygen level, their temperature, 
their uh, breathing rate. Wow, and okay. if any of that was out of whack, we told them stay home and go see the doctor, <laughs> right? And so that helped um, reduce the risk for uh, people who are asymptomatic. So our, our chief health and medical officer, uh, Dr. J.D. Polk, was awesome. He was really awesome during this whole thing, and he put some things in place, in place for COVID that actually were replicated across other government agencies later on in COVID. Do you think uh, people, there was there a lot of like sort of bottom up innovation on this? Like people found ways to do the work Ab that didn't come from the top down, like, hey, do it this way. Absolutely. You know, we're already doing it. Absolutely. Um, one example was flight software development. You know, managers told people at the centers, um, you have to go into work and be with the flat sat or the Iron Bird, right, to do your flight software development. And they just figured out how to configure the system to get in remotely, and they were doing coding development and testing remotely. You didn't need to be going to work. Yeah, this is a small example. And there's, I suppose there is, a, there is a greater focus on software development nowadays, because just because there is simply more software in play in any science mission, in any exploration mission, uh, in the ISS, of course. And that can, a lot of that can be done remotely, but ultimately you need to get together at some point Yep. Did you, did you, uh, how did you, how did you sort of finesse that? Like, when was it okay to actually make that decision? Like, all right, let's get together. Like you people at this center are good to go. Yeah. So we, we had each center, uh, we delegated that authority to each center. Right. Right. So we gave top down guidance. Here are the programs that no kidding. We're going to keep moving forward, um, during COVID and we just need to figure center a you need to figure out how to do that in a way that keeps the um, workforce safe and and healthy and so for example you might hear this from thomas later that um, the perseverance mission because of the planetary launch window and the fact that we only have a mars earth conjunction every 26 months we were going to hit the planetary launch yeah. window that that summer right yeah and so we made um, that a priority i convinced the um uh, I, well, we convinced the um, attorneys and flight operations folks to use research aircraft to actually transport JPL employees and others from California to the Kennedy Space Center and back. We call it Perseverance Air. We had Perseverance Air going because we didn't know if it was safe to fly on commercial right. aircraft. So as an example, we used NASA. We sort of uh, suspended the NASA rules against using research aircraft to transport people. And uh, because we didn't know the risk, we managed that risk in that way, um, as, as well as the Fitbits and other things. So um, we definitely set priorities um, and then work, had this, work with the centers and our contractors, too, our, our contractors, um, to figure out how to keep those missions moving forward. Because not all the missions were done at centers. A lot of them were done at contractors through prime contracts. Mm -hmm. you, mentioned, uh, you mentioned, of course, Bridenstine and the senator. Like, but you yourself are an engineer. When do you think? I was an engineer. Once an engineer. Then I became a government bureaucrat, and now I'm allegedly an entrepreneur. <laughs> I don't know if they can. <laughs> you still get your hands dirty? Uh, no, not really. <laughs> At home, maybe, right? I, I fixed our dryer the other day by watching a YouTube video, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, other than that, I don't do much. <laughs> well, I'm nice to hear. Um, <laughs> Uh, you have hummingbird feeders? Didn't you talk about that? The other oh, yeah, no, yeah, we talked about yeah. hummingbird feeders. Yeah, I changed the uh, food in the hummingbird feeders. Yeah, well, hummingbird. somebody's got to do it. Yeah, um, yeah. So, but what, so when, when do you think it is advantageous to have a, a scientist or an engineer at the top of NASA versus when is the time for someone who has a background in politics or in business yeah. administration, management? Yeah, you know, I think, I'm thinking about that. You asked that question. I was trying to think of what's the, what it would be a... Uh, uh, a politically correct answer or a reasonable answer. <laughs> I would tell you that I think the most important thing for the NASA administrator is to be a excellent communicator. Whether they have a technical background or a political background, they communicate. You cannot over communicate as the leader of NASA because you have so many. Uh, the great thing is uh, about NASA is it has a great brand, it has a great following, a lot of people care what NASA is doing. The not so great thing about NASA is it has a great brand and a great following, and a lot of people care what you're doing, including you know the the uh, the every you know our board of directors or every member of the House of Representatives and every senator, right? So um, that makes it super challenging. Um, so that was um, that that was a real talent of of Jim's. Um, Jim was a re Jim Bridenstine was an amazing communicator. 
you could brief Jim on a mission that he hadn't heard anything about until that day. And literally like two hours later, he would be briefing and asking questions on the mission like he had worked on the mission for years. He, he really had a talent for that and, and he was really good at it. And, I, and, and he did have the connections. As a, as a former congressman, he did have the connections on the Hill and the personal relationships. And so, and I, I, think, um, I think also Senator Nelson is a really good communicator. I was at the Artemis One launch when it actually launched. Um, it was an amazing day and it's been an amazing mission. Kudos to... SLS performed, you know, within 0.3% of all the performance specs, right? And Orion is doing amazing, fingers crossed for re-entry and landing. Um, and um, Senator Nelson gave a pre-launch briefing, no slides, no notes, I think it was a half an hour, and went through, you know, why we're doing Artemis and the importance of Artemis 1 and what we're going to do, you know, what NASA is going to do in Artemis 2 and Artemis 3 and did an amazing job. So he's obviously a, been a real supporter of NASA throughout his political career. He's a really good communicator. I think he's being really effective as a uh, administrator. And he's got a deputy administrator, right, who, who is a former, an amazing former test pilot and a former astronaut and technologist and an AA who's also a former astronaut. He's got really good technical people behind him to be able to effectively lead the agency and make those you know, technical decisions and calls. And as long as he's willing to delegate some of that authority on the technical side, which he has, you know, he's, he'll be continue to do a great job. Good, well, yeah, communication obviously important in any, in any position. In any like leadership that. position. Yeah, yeah. Right, absolutely, I agree. Uh, something that has been increasingly important, of course, in recent years is commercial partnerships, uh, working with a company like SpaceX on the Demo 2 and uh, Crew Dragon, stuff like that. But of course, there were serious setbacks. The, uh, the anomaly in 2019 was a, a major one and very unexpected. I mean, like all anomalies, it's part of the, it's in the name. But, yep. uh, but you were, I don't know if you were like on the range, but you were certainly monitoring things. What was your sort of the immediate reaction and how, do, and how did you start getting things back on track? Yeah, so the interesting thing about the relationship between NASA and SpaceX, it, it evolved on commercial crew, it evolved significantly over time. It started out where SpaceX was like, NASA, we got this, just sit back, we'll deliver you a vehicle and a rocket that you could fly your astronauts on. But then as we encountered um, challenges um, with some things that on Falcon and Dragon, um, Falcon and Dragon for cargo or Falcon for commercial government launches of robotic spacecraft, um, some challenges that would have been fine for launching a robotic spacecraft, they were not going to be technical challenges, they were not going to be fine for a crewed flight. Um, and so it turned out that that anomaly on Amos surfaced an issue with uh, a composite overwrap pressure vessel um, in the LOX tank. Um, and the design of that, uh, that hardware and the way they were um, operating the vehicle on the pad during preps for launch. And it was an amazing collaboration between the SpaceX engineers and the NASA engineers, primarily at White Sands for doing testing and Johnson for doing analysis and Langley for doing some technology development that we work through um, the solution to that, um, both on the design of the COPVs and how they loaded uh, the helium into the bottle and loaded locks into the tank um, to get the risk of that down to an acceptable level for NASA to accept it. Now, I did have people on the outside of NASA screaming at me to get the high pressure helium bottle out of the LOX tank. <laughs> it's like, why the heck are you having an ignition source in a LOX environment? Did you not read the you know, report from Apollo 1, right? Um, but we decided that it was better to, um, to uh, work that, ano that anomaly and get that configuration to work and completely change the configuration and sort of negate all the previous launch experience with Falcon 9. So that was a conscious decision that we made, but it was pretty controversial. And then I was in launch control firing room four for the Demo 2 flight, uh, the first crewed flight, and I was watching the screen and watching the LOX tank fill and get up to the where the 
the, the, uh, the level where the COPVs were at and get past that level and everything was fine. And of course that turned out to be a completely successful mission. They've, NASA's had several successful crew missions to SpaceX since then. But it really was a partnership between the technical team at SpaceX and the technical team at NASA to get through that challenge as well as other challenges that we had on the, on the vehicle and get to that Demo-2 flight and get, get that capability you know, launching U.S. astronauts from U.S. soil again for the first time in a decade since the retirement of the shuttle program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in the middle of a global pandemic. Yeah, well, it's, it's amazing when you when you put it like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it really captured. I think the, the nation was looking for something positive to latch on to at yeah, the we time. <laughs> so I think we got a lot more general public attention for that Demo Two flight in May of 2020. Um, because of the pandemic, not that I would wish a global pandemic on us ever again, but um, because of the pandemic and, and the good news story there, um, than we would have otherwise. Well, now you're, uh, you're sort of on the other, the other end of the table and you're running your own company and uh, you may, I'm sure you'll have all kinds of relationships with NASA and other agencies. Uh, what are some things that, uh, that the private industry and agencies like NASA can do to make it easier on each other, make better, better communication? Like, what, what did you learn from that, that partnership as it grew to being a, a real partnership, not just right. emails? Right, right. So it, I think the communication needs to be two-way. You know, commercial can't sit back and say, hey, government agency, give me your requirements, and I'll go figure out how to meet them. And you just, you just sign here that you'll buy what I'm selling so I can go raise money and everything will be good. Um, and, uh, and government industry can't just sit back in, and not communicate and listen to commercial and what opportunities commercial could bring to meeting their mission more effectively and more efficiently. So I think this two-way comm, like uh, Colonel Roth mentioned, is, is really important. And it needs to be iterative. Um, like, you know, we're, we're trying to figure out how to, um, you know, what's the best way to sell SDA data to, go, to the Space Force? Um, is it through the SDA marketplace and the UDL? Is it by some other mechanism? What sort of quality control does, um, does uh, the Space Force need to have uh, and need to do um, quality uh, VNV on our data before they buy it, et cetera? Um, so we're working through that right now, but I think just c continuing to communicate and iterate and find out what the best uh, mechani mechanism is for commercial to sell to many, right? Nobody wants to be the anchor tenant um, and, to, and to leverage capabilities into the government and other commercial activities in the most, most effective way is going to be really important. Gotcha. Uh, I feel like... Uh launch and um, orbit operations, these very highly visible things, like you said, you know, the world was watching on Demo 2, these are very, very high profile missions, uh, but commercial and uh, private, private companies are, are getting into lots more than just, just you know, launch and orbital operations. Are, are there any sort of areas or companies or spaces that you would like to highlight that are maybe not getting as much, uh, not, uh, put a little ink where it, where it isn't right Yeah, now? I think there are a couple of things that, um have driven uh, innovation significantly. You know, one is, uh, first one is the continual, Moore's law just keeps, there's no end to Moore's law. Now, now we will transition to quantum computing at some point. By the way, quantum space has nothing to do with quantum technology. We just like the name. Or does so it? anyway, just, uh, but, um, but I think the, just the advances in computing technology, like I said earlier, we're, we're gonna have a two teraflop processor on our ESPA class spacecraft on our first mission. That just m is mind boggling to me. Uh, the compute capability we'll have on board and, and how we can extend the cloud and extend edge computing to space. So I think the, the first one is this advanced, continued advancement in computing and how we've figured out how to have computers through error detection and correction and redundancy be able to operate in the space environment. The second thing is the miniaturization of sensors and actuators. This continued miniaturization, I think, has enabled um, many applications that otherwise would not have been enabled. And then the third thing is additive manufacturing, 3D printing. It's transformed everything, just not aerospace, but everything, right? And so when you take that advancement in computing, the miniaturization of sensors and actuators and 3D printing, you sort of have 
the secret sauce for CubeSats and small spacecraft. I mean, it's an innovation that's been enabled by, primarily by, I think, those three things. And I think that's just, uh, that combined with the significant reduction in the cost of launch has really opened up opportunities, has gotten business cases to close that never would have closed uh, without the te technology and without the reduction in the cost of launch. Right. Well, we've only got a couple seconds left, but I'll just ask you one quick thing. Uh, now that you're, you're running your own company after years at NASA and other, uh, other work, uh, do you miss it? Oh, yeah, I miss NASA. <laughs> I do. I miss the mission, and I miss the people. Yeah. Well, yep. you, got a, you got a new mission, some new people. It yeah, well, I'm, and, but I'm having, to, I'm having a, I'm, I love the, our company and what we're doing. I love the, pe are the 22 people that we've hired so far at the company. I'm, I'm having a lot of fun. Good. Well, that's what's important. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you again for filling in, and uh, thank you for coming out today. All right. Thanks for the opportunity. Thanks, everybody.